Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. Today's session is part three of a four-part session, of a four-part series, uh, and it's titled African Diaspora Communities Across South Asia, Afro-South Asia in the Global African diaspora. Throughout South Asia, from Karachi and Gujarat to Karnataka and Hyderabad, there are communities of African descent. The book, Afro-South Asia in the Global African Diaspora, Volume 2, focuses on how these marginalized groups have confronted the challenges of sustaining community and pride while negotiating contested questions of identity, home, and belonging through religious practices and reinvented cultural traditions. Their vibrant religious practices, music, and textiles provide a basis for belonging in an atmosphere where discrimination creates additional obstacles to the social and economic well being and advancement. This evening, there will be two presentations. The first presentation is by Professor Purnima Mehta Bhatt, titled Slavery and the Slave Trade in India. Slavery in India differs from slavery practice in the new world. Questions of assimilation, acculturation, and culture exchange in the diasporic communities will be examined along with the significant contributions. The second presentation has two parts. Part one by Professor Amy Caitlin Jarazbhoy, uh, which is titled The Siddhi Malang Speaks, an ethnomusicologist describes her collaborations in music, dance, and touring with the Siddhi Goma group in Gujarat, as well as efforts to revive the playing of a sacred bow, the Mahanga. Part two by Nkosetati uh, Arni Koela is titled Seeds of the Braced Bow, the flower, the seed, and the bee, focusing on the instrumentalist as alchemist, sonic healer, and cultural treasure, the speaker uncovers the reality of a rich shared consciousness of Ngoma and pre-colonial history between Afro-Asia to the making of the musical bow. Ngoma is a proto-banto uh, cognate within which exists an e ecology of related institutions, such as the practice of medicine, divination, crafts, music, and ritual. The full bios of all our speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen, uh, and our speakers will address them towards the end of the session. And uh, now over to uh, Dr. Robbins uh, to introduce the session. Thank you very much, Leica. As usual, you've given us a fantastic um, introduction and um, I'm going to share my screen and the thing disappear. Okay. We've started with three volumes on uh, Africans in India. We started in an unusual way talking about the achievement of Africans because it surprises many people to learn that Africans in the diaspora have created many different contributions to society, including in India, the case of several African dynasties of local rulers. The second volume we talked about continued this theme of the achievements of Africans, where we dealt with black ambassadors of politics, religion, and uh, music in India. And we particularly focused last week on jazz. And this week, we're going to focus on a more traditional basis that comes out of the third book, which dealt with the African diaspora and communities across South Asia. And in this book, we talked about the slave trade because you hear much about the Atlantic slave trade and we needed to have an expert on the Indian Ocean slave trade, which we have with us. We also focused a number of lectures, a number of articles on Bava Gore, uh, an African Sufi saint, and the music associated with him, and the fact that there were African communities that were mostly Muslim uh, across, across South Asia, but also there were Christian communities, for example, in Karnataka, 
And then we ended by focusing on the uh, making of uh, music, the making of, of uh, quilts and so on and so forth. So now I'll, so our first speaker is Pramila Bhatt and Pradima Bhatt. She is an emeritus professor of Hood College. She taught anthropology, history and interdisciplinary studies as a PhD in African history. And she focuses on a number of very important themes in her five books and her forthcoming sixth book. First of all, she focuses on the role of women, feminists, for example, and exploring the stepwells of Gujarat in terms of the space, women's space. She's now working on a book on the question of the search for fair skin and whiteness in the global South. And this is where I would like to take some of the studies that I'm doing also to the questions of so-called race and color. But most interestingly for us here, she's focused on slavery and the African diaspora in India, assimilation, cultural change and survival. So let me give it over to Professor Bat. It was a wonderful person. Thank you very much, Ken. The institution of slavery in India differs markedly from slavery practiced in the new world, which lasted from 16 to the 19th centuries. Slavery in South Asia was not limited to persons of African descent. In the Islamic world, unlike in the West, slavery and race were not necessarily linked. A distinction needs to be made also between domestic and military servitude found in India and plantation slavery in the new world. In the Indian Ocean world and India, a slave could achieve manumission, upward mobility, and accumulate wealth. This was in marked contrast to chattel slavery, where the slave was regarded merely as property to be bought, sold, and given away freely. In India, slaves generally were viewed as extensions of the family. They enjoyed greater rights and freedoms, and the relationship bit forged between the slaves and their owners was based on loyalty, patronage, and attachment. Some slaves rose to elite positions as rulers, as commanders of armies, as administrators, and governors of provinces and often themselves became slave owners. The earliest reference in Indian texts to the slave trade uh, or to slavery as an institution comes from the Rig Veda, which is dated to approximately 1400 BC to 900 BC. It mentions the dark-skinned Dastyus, possibly a reference to the indigenous population of the Indus Valley civilization who were overrun and defeated and subsequently enslaved by the Aryans. There are also references to slave in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The history of slavery in the Indian Ocean world is both complex and varied. Slavery was recognized and sanctioned by both Hindu and Muslim law. In India, Slave labor was abundant, labor itself was abundant and easily available due to the hierarchical structure of the society. The Dharma Shastras, the ancient texts of jurisprudence, as well as the Buddhist and Jain texts, also mention slaves given as gifts to temples, monastic orders and religious institutions by laymen who obtained religious merit or punya for this act. 
Hindu law identified and classified many different kinds of slaves. One could become a slave through capture in war or by birth, indebtedness, purchase, inheritance, as well as desertion. The Arthashastra, another important text from the fourth century of the common era, granted slaves the right to retain inheritance, which would then pass to their kinfolk upon their death. Islamic law clearly defined the legal rights of slaves, especially the concubines, regarding both emancipation and the children born to them sired by the masters who could not be sold as slaves. Slaves who were converted to the religion of Islam may have found it easier to gain a measure of acceptance and to assimilate in their new homeland. As early as the late 18th century, advertisements in journals and newspapers often lump slaves with pigs, gold, and silver. Banaji's study of slavery in India cites, and I quote, wanted two kafres, which means kafirs or Africans, who can play on the French horn and are otherwise hardy and useful about the house relative to the business of Hansama or that of a cook, close quotes. Another ad pertains to a gentleman, and this is even more interesting, seeking, and I quote, two very handsome African ladies of the true sable hue between the ages of 14 and 25 for sexual services, close quotes. Yet another ad stated, to be sold by private sale, two coffre boys about 18 years of age belonging to a Portuguese padre lately deceased. This indicates that not just private individuals, but even the Catholic clergy often owned African slaves. Let me talk briefly about elite slavery in India. Most African slaves were not brought to India for their labor. Since the existing feudal system and caste structure provided ample cheap labor, they were symbols of status and prestige, mainly for elite consumption. See, these slaves had the reputation of being trustworthy, faithful, energetic, brave, courageous, and loyal. African elite slaves became military commanders, admirals, bodyguards, and keepers of the royal seals. Eventually, some became wazirs and governors also. A few became founders of dynasties like the Sharkis in Jaunpur and the states of Sachin and Janjira, which were ruled by Africans. See these like Malik Amber, who may be the best known um, CD or, Afri or person of African descent in Ahmednagar and Ikhlas Khan and Sidi Masood of Bijapur became the most powerful officials in the Deccani Sultanates. The English merchant Finch, William Finch, wrote in 1610 that Malik Amber commanded some 10,000 of his own caste, meaning Africans, all brave soldiers, and some 40,000 decades. A brief discussion of the Indian Ocean slave trade. The Atlantic slave trade to the New World has received much greater attention from scholars. But transportation of slaves from the east coast of Africa to Asia and the Mediterranean predates the New World Atlantic slave trade by nearly a thousand years. The Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, a first century account of an Alexandrian sailor, describes the extensive trade along the Indian Ocean and the types of merchandise exchanged in this. The link between India and the African continent in antiquity 
is further borne by the discovery of coins from the ancient kingdom of Aksum. Aksum was what was Ethiopia, or uh, what we call present day Ethiopia. From, and these are from fourth century of the common era found in Mangalore in Southern India. The exports from Africa to India included ivory, gold, slaves, leopard skins, rhinoceros horn, and tortoise shells. Africans came to India not only as slaves, but as traders, as merchants, as mercenaries, as sailors, as crewmen, as pearl drivers, and concubines for the princely rulers of India. They constituted, however, a small number of the total population of slaves. The total number of slaves exported to the New World, it is suggested, uh, over a period of simply nearly four centuries and no more than that, was about 12 and a half million slaves. This is to the New World which is about the same number sent over a much longer period, perhaps 900 years, to Asia, to Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. The impact of the trade on Africa was far more intense and traumatic in the case of the Atlantic slave trade. And the disruption caused to the society was significantly greater in comparison to the Indian Ocean slave trade. Advances in medicine, combined with the introduction of firearms and the exploration of the African continent by adventurers and travelers, opened the African continent to the outside world and to greater exploitation. Slaves brought in East Africa for about six to $12 could fetch from 60 to $200 in the markets of Asia. For the slave dealers, it was worth running just about any, any kind of risk. The earliest references in Indian texts to the presence of Africans in India mentions the Ethiopian soldier, Jamaluddin bin Yakut, who was in the service of the female ruler, Razia Begum, who was the Sultan of Delhi, from 1236 to 1240. It is a popularly held belief that this fiercely independent Sultan fell in love with Yakult and they had a love affair. She was supposedly uh, deposed for her affair with an African and um, he unfortunately was executed for his transgression. Ibn Battuta, who traveled through India in the 14th century, also makes a mention of African slaves. He remarked in the role that Abyssinians, which is the same as Hapshis or Africans, played as the guarantors of safety in the Indian Ocean. He makes a mention of eunuch by the name of Sunwal, who attended him during his visit to in uh, Delhi. And he also says, that the Sultan of Delhi presented him with African slave girls. In the 15th century, a Russian traveler by the name of Nikiti found that in Dabhor, which is in Ratnagiri district of present-day Maharashtra, that Dabhor was a meeting place for cultures and people from the west coast of India and in Ethiopia. Nikiti also visited the Bahamani king and refers to the Bazir. Muhammad Gawan, said to be an African. Another European traveler, Pires, Tom Pires, in the 16th century, also refers to the presence of Habshis in the Deccan. By the 16th century, a number of Africans had acquired political and military power, especially in the Deccan. As early as the 15th century, the Portuguese were importing slaves into India from Mozambique and from Zanzibar. They were mainly to be found in the Portuguese territory of Bees, Daman, and Goa. Linschoten, a Dutch Protestant merchant and a writer, traveled through Goa in the 16th, late 16th century. 
During his travels, he encountered African slaves in India. And describing slavery in Goa, Lynchurton states that the Portuguese owned on an average five, six, 10, or 20 slaves, both men and women. Portuguese Fidalgos, which is the nobleman, imported slaves from colonies in Africa and used them primarily as domestic servants. The Fidalgos were attended by many slaves during their banquets to fan away the flies and to play music for their masters while they ate. Another writer from the 17th century des describes and mentions that female slaves comprised both African as well as Indians. But he says, and I quote, of all those females, the most pleasing are the servant girls, the Kafres of Mozambique, and those from other parts of Africa who are black, colored, very dark, and have curly hair and who are called negresses of Guinea. He describes many of them as enormously beautiful. The explorer Richard Burton in his travel, traveled through Gujarat during the 19th century and reported that annually 600 to 700 Africans were arriving on the coast of Gujarat. I would like to talk very briefly about the Indian Ocean trade and the role of Indian merchants in this trade, a subject that is not very well known or studied. The Indian traders played an active role in the Indian Ocean slave trade from the 15th to the 19th century. In return for textiles, East African products such as slaves, ivory, gold were sent to India. According to the census taken in East Africa in 1887, the total population of Gujaratis on the East African coast numbered six and a half thousand, of which the majority were Kojas and Vanias. During the 17th and 18th centuries, Gujarati merchants of Deo more or less held a monopoly over the trade with Mozambique and the Swahili coast. During the 19th century, Zanzibar emerges as the center of a vast commercial empire. Richard Burton found that the merchant, that the center, the merchants were par excellence, the Vanias of par excellence are the enterprising Bhatias or Kach Banias. He states further that almost the whole foreign trade passes through their hands. They are the principal shopkeepers and artisans. Indian traders particularly controlled also all the custom houses along the East African coast. Zanzibar, Pemba, Mombasa, Bagamoyo, Kilwa, and they had a near monopoly over the customs along the coast. Most of the Indians participated in the slave trade as financiers, while it was the Arabs who actually captured and obtained slaves from the interior. But this was a partnership. By the middle of the 19th century, Indians in Zanzibar had acquired clove plantations that required intensive use of labor, slave labor. Despite British proclamations and laws which imposed severe punishments on those involved in the trade in humans, these Kachi traders continue to participate in the slave trade and hold slaves as domestic, concubine, and even plantation workers. The abolition of slavery. The British formally abolished the slave trade in 1843. Subsequently, their naval ships began to, began to patrol the Indian Ocean to capture and confiscate the dhows transporting African slaves to India and beyond. Bombay was the headquarters of the British anti-slavery patrol. In the year 1860, the British consul Rigby launched a campaign to emancipate nearly 8,000 
slaves owned by Indians in East Africa, whom he regarded as British subjects. The abolition of the slave trade did not mean that slavery and slaveholding ended in India. This was especially the case in the princely states or protected states in Western India that enjoyed autonomous status. The plight of freed slaves, Arab Dhaus continue, continued to illegally transport human gar cargo to the be sold in the slave markets of the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea ports. Occasionally, the British anti-slavery patrols intercepted these ships and emancipated the slaves. The freed Africans were sent to Aden, to Seychelles, and to Bombay. However, their lot was a pathetic one. They were strangers in a strange land, in a wretched and helpless condition with no one to care for them. In 1860, the Church Missionary Society established a home for these slaves known, and the, and the asylum was known as the African Asylum in Sharanpur near Nasik in Maharashtra. Children were also sent to the Roman Catholic Orphanage at Bandra and the Mission High School in Ahmednagar and the American Mission in Sirur in Pune. The, the African Asylum was finally closed in 1875. The majority of the freed slaves were forced to live lives of poverty and misery. The gazetteers make a special mention of the CDs in Bombay in the neighborhood of Umarkhadi Jail and close to Ripon Road, where dwelt many of the Sidis or the African Muslims. A few words about the Bombay Africans, about which we know so little. About one-fifth of the freed slaves, known as Bombay Africans, were sent from Bombay to settle in Frere Town near Mombasa, in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, under the auspices of the Church Missionary Society of London. By 1880, there were more than 3,000 Bombay Africans in East Africa. They played an invaluable role in anti-slavery efforts and the spread of Christianity all along the East African coast, as well as the exploration of the interior of Africa. Missionaries, of course, were hopeful that these emancipated Africans would actively help in the evangelization of other Africans on the continent. Bombay Africans made significant contributions to the expedition of Livingston, Burton, Stanley, Speak, Harry Johnston, and other explorers in the 19th of the 19th century. They played the roles of interpreters, guides, cooks, gun bearers, coolies, and guards. In um, 1865, and I just need to mention this, David Livingston, who, the great explorer um, to East and Central Africa, went to East and Central Africa, where he was provided valuable assistance by the Bombay Africans. When Livingston died, it was nine freed African slaves who accompanied his body from the interior all the way to the coast. In fact, Wainwright, one of those, even attended his funeral in England, where he was presented to Queen Victoria in 1874 and later received the National Geographic Society's Medal. Another uh, freed slave was a very competent Bombay African who assisted an English doctor at the mission's free dispensary in Mombasa and was an indispensable apprentice at the 16-bed hospital. James Joan established the first printing press in Kenya. These were all, these were all freed African. The Bombay Africans from Rabai and Mombasa were editors of the first English and key Swahili publications, such as the Post Express and Mwalimu. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Africans uh, had 
the uh, Bombay Africans had finished their mission work uh, among the freed slaves and ended their history. And their contributions have mostly been forgotten and neglected. These freed slaves, I want to point out, referred to as Bombay Africans, challenged the prevailing image of the Africans as passive victims of the slave trade. They testified to the important role they played in the exploration of the African continent and the contributions they made in the mapping of the continent without their knowledge of the lay of the land, their linguistic skills, and their understanding of the indigenous peoples. The expeditions, the geographical expeditions could not have succeeded in their endeavors. Today, the descendants of Africans in India, known as Sibis and sometimes as Hapshis from the word Abyssinia, consider India as their home and have expressed little inclination to return to Africa, despite their emotional ties to the continent. This suggests that notwithstanding all the challenges CBs face in India, and they are a marginalized group, they have tried to assimilate into Indian culture and envision that their future is linked to this country, to India. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is just a wonderful picture. I begin my book with the, it's on the cover of the book. Um, I did a lot of my field work in Ahmedabad and Patharpua. And these children are the wonderful, happy, joyous children of um, the uh, descendants of Africans known as the Sidi. Next, please. Okay, just another child I was well taken. Okay, and this is a map and you can see the bigger one. I wish I could point out things. This shows you the west coast of India and all the places where the CDs were prominent in Gujarat, in Sachin, uh, in Janjira, in downtown in Karnataka and then down to uh, also to uh, Maldives and Sri Lanka where the CDs and of course Pakistan and on those other side, you see the East African coast all the way from Ethiopia to Egypt to Somalia to Mozambique to Zanzibar, where the slaves were obtained and transported. So it was the Indian Ocean that enabled uh, the slaves to go from the East Coast of Africa to the Western part of India. Thank you. Next, please. This is what the dhaus looked like. The slaves were transported in this. And incidentally, when I was in, the, uh, in Dubai and in the Middle East, I was still seeing these dhaus plying the water. So it was very exciting. Next, please. Uh, those who are from Ahmedabad know this. This is the CD Sayyid Mosque. It's one of the pride of Ahmedabad city, a beautiful, architecturally breathtaking mosque. And this was built by uh, descendants of the African slaves. Next, please. This is a close up of the Jali. So spectacular. It is reason for every Gujarati. And this is again, the next one is the, called the Julta Minar, again, built by a Sidi, um, a wonder of Ahmedabad. The next, please. Okay, I just want to spend a half a minute on this one, half a, well, less than half a minute. The, the image that you see on the screen, which I'm hardly seeing, is that of Jahangir, the great ruler. If you want, see carefully, he's standing on a globe to symbolize that he's the ruler of the world. And under the globe is um, what, what should be land, and I can't see it there, but, but he's the ruler of the, all the lands. And under that is a fish. So he's a ruler also of all the seas. And what he's doing, and which is absolutely sort of amazing to me and strange, he's trying to shoot the head of Malik Amba, who is an African, who was in Ahmednagar, an enormously powerful um, leader of, in Ahmednagar. Jagir never met him. And yet, uh, yet uh, um, he must have been, uh, Malik Ambar must have been so powerful, his image so overbearing that he's, ma he's making a pretense of killing his head and destroying his head. A very interesting painting. Okay, next, please. Next, please. 
Okay, this is Malik Ambar, the great, and he was a he was an important uh, administrator in the Deccan, and of course feared by all, particularly the great Mughal rulers. Yes, next please. I won't stop at this. This is the son of uh, Malik Ambar, Fat Khan. Next, please let's go because they're okay. And this is uh, Ikhlas Khan another very important African uh, ruler, powerful African ruler um, in um, Bijapur. And Bijapur was a center where Africans were enormously powerful in the Deccan. Please, next, please. Again, Ikhlas Khan, next, please. Um, again, uh, we can skip this one. I've already shown you. This is nice because the CD, uh, this is a beautiful painting of a eunuch. Now, we may reject eunuchs, but eunuchs played a very important role in the royal families, the elite families, princely families, and because they had no loyalty. Supposedly, they, they could only be loyal to the ruler. And oftentimes, they became so powerful that they were really the real power behind the throne. It's a lovely, lovely image of uh, uh, eunuch. Okay, next, please. Uh, music. Uh, Amy um, Jairas boy, Caitlin is going to talk about music and she's the specialist. But see, these were also great performers of music and they were in Gujarat particularly. They were Sufis. They were say, followers of the Sufi uh, cult. Um, in other places in Portuguese, uh, the uh, see these uh, became uh, Catholic. And in Karnataka, they were Hindu. So they are constantly adapting to the situation that they encounter. Okay, next, please. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, take an Anamdabad. Again, let's skip this too small for me to see. Uh, once again, skip, please. And here you see, I just want you to see the little image of a person in red. And he's a CD, supposedly. He's go, uh, with the ruler, the sultan. He's carrying what looks like a hookah. Or, but we know that Sidi bodyguards often carried weapons and uh, concealed them in their bodies in order to protect the sultan or the ruler. Next, please. Another one. Let's skip this one. Uh, uh, again, it shows the, the figures on, uh, in, uh, on the right are all CDs. They are guards, bodyguards, hookah bearers. Uh, they are holding weapons. Uh, once again, Deccani paintings are really replete with wonderful paintings showing CDs. Okay, next, please. I end up with this because it just took my breath away when I saw this. In From the Deccan. Uh, so it's from the Deccan School of Art. And here you see the most exquisite rendition of a garden with ornamental trees and beautifully ornamented, handsome CDs in orange turbans and orange clothing. And this is one of my favorite. Okay, I think that's, uh, I believe that's what done. Thank you very much, everyone. I just wanted to start off this section by telling you a little bit about my experiences uh, this is the first time I met uh, the Sidis, uh, the Africans in Ahmedabad. And I came to a small community in the old city and was welcomed into a small room. And before you know it, that room was full of drummers and children. And uh, we couldn't believe that so many people got into that room. They said, will you join us tonight? We're performing at somebody's 25th anniversary. So there you see me as part of the African troupe. And uh, my major concern and that of my wife was the, that the performance included people throwing up coconuts and breaking them with their heads and breathing out fire. And I was afraid I was gonna either get hit with a coconut or fire. Now, when we, the thing that we're gonna be talking about today with the next two speakers is a little bit complicated. So I thought I might, summarize it quickly. Uh, there is a narrative about a Sufi saint named Bhava Gore in Gujarat. The Sidi community honors him as an ancestral Sufi saint. He's credited with the defeat of a local demoness with the help of his brother and his sister. His sister, my Misra, also defeats demons and is uh, also uh, people come to uh, 
shrines involved with her. And she's also the name of a, 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 a instrument is named after her, my mistra. This Baba Gore is particularly related to the Sidis, but he's also remembered as a great agate trader. And as somebody who came from Africa, we don't really know exactly when or who he was, but his chief shrine is in Ratanpur in Gujarat. And there's small shrines related to him elsewhere in Gujarat. One of the things that you see is the so-called Dhamal dance. Uh, this is a, uh, a company school painting done in Kutch by a Muslim artist who also painted the Hindu uh, processional, which you can see in the Palace Museum in Kutch, in Bhuj. And we see a continuity in terms of the instrumentation. On the left-hand side, we see 17th century um, African lyre. Uh, this is a Deccany painting. On the right-hand side, we see similar instruments uh, in a um, dargar in Mumbai. Um, the, I just want to share one more slide with you. And that is this picture of Wasim, a city with a Malunga. Malunga is a bow. And we're gonna have both our speakers talking about this bow. Now the first speaker that we have whose name I will massacre, is in Kosinami Ernie Koala. He's a PhD student at the University of Cape Town. And he's an African multi-instrumentalist, producer, instrument maker, writer, playwright, director, singer, etc. And he sees the music embedded in an African spirituality. And he sees this as something that helps to transmit African culture across Africa and outside Africa's borders. And it's the, the concept is hard to describe, it's fluid and dynamic. And as he says, it has a set of archives and perceptible markers that make it uh, recognizable. So uh, we'd like to turn this over to, um, to Ernie at this point. And Leica, if you could, uh, uh, try his video at this point. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Ngosena Tikwela. I'm very grateful to be here with you all today. I'm grateful for the organizers um, of this wonderful cohort and gathering. And uh, I just wanted to speak to you about Ngoma, I want to speak to you about the Afro-Asian connection and uh, unpack the relationship or the musicological relationship that exists and existed within Africa and Asia through a small video and uh, small yes but also large uh, that will be the main body of this conversation would be the documentation. Right now I just want to introduce it to you and unpack it for you so that you're able to engage with it in a way that I have had, I've intended as much as you're free to engage with it in whichever way that it resonates with you. So just to give some context on the nature of the study, in the periods of 2016 through to 2017, 18, 19, I was undergoing a master's where I had been doing research in the field around the profound relationship between musical instrumentalists and makers and understanding them as sages and knowers and priests and priestesses who through their practice acquired a very acute knowledge of their culture, the medicinal practices within their culture, the context, a retention of and dissemination of knowledge systems all through understanding how to make a certain instrument. In this case, being the most unique instrument within the African consciousness amongst its relationship, in my opinion, 
within Africa and Asia, which was the musical bow, or let's say that one that has survived very strongly, albeit contentiously within this time as things dip and fade and reemerge. And so I caught it through one of its phases of reemerging in India through the documentary that one of uh, our uh, guests today, who I have an honor of being with in this panel, uh, Amy Catlin, or Caitlin, sorry, in case I'm saying it wrong. Um, and so grateful to be you know, together and making this connection due to the fact that what struck me most about the time that I engaged with that documentary text of resurgence and reteaching and creating necessary conditions for the Malunga as a musical instrument and bow to reemerge and resurvive within the Afro, uh, if within the Afro Asian, Afro Indian context within India in Gujarat, and at that time I was in my own life very interested in reintegrating relationships with master players, master makers who make musical bows at the time, and understanding the consciousness that exists within that framework. And it was so profound to see that reemergence or that conversation happening through this documentary with young men learning how to make the instruments, learning from masters, learning uh, songs, playing at the end, and thinking about how powerful that moment is and will be for the resuscitation and rejuvenation of the sacred playing and sacred arts of indigenous bows and their consciousness within Africa and as it were Asia. And so what, what I found most interesting with watching this was how much I knew about musical bows and through my studies and through relationships with master bow makers, I spent time learning how to make bows and how to play them, how to maintain them, how they should be played and maintained, learning the ethical, religious, spiritual relationships of those instruments. And the reason why I found the relationship so poignant coming from a Southern African background is that I had encountered musical bows such as Wati, such as Umkhope, that, that I knew that there was something special about this relationship, particularly if I look at it through the, the lens of bow music. And so, what I had then endeavored to do is understand the, the relationships between Africa and Asia between the years 300 and 1500 AD and understanding how those relationships happen in the Indianic uh, trades, some ethical and unethical trades that happen within that time, the movements of people and cultures and understanding how, how, how exactly did that bow get there and what relationship does it have to Africa, uh, South Africa, and, and where would that have started? Also, what would constitute me saying that that is a Southern African, or not even Southern African, but an African bow that then made its way to India? And so these conversations is what I was interested in. And I looked at the East Coast of Africa because that is where the relationship happened. Uh, coming from Mozambique, connecting to the hinterlands of South Africa, KZN, moving up to Malawi, moving through Uganda and the Great Lakes, going all the way into Ethiopia, um, or Abyssinia, as it was known at the time. And so that east coast of Africa became such a central region with connecting India, but also connecting South Africa to the rest of the continent as a lot of the, the Bandu ancestral migrations link itself to the Great Lakes, going into Mali, going into Kemet, going into uh, its relationship with Uganda, Abyssinia, Kenya, Congo. And so what I then endeavored to do was spend time with masters, particularly for the study was the regions of Mozambique, the region of Nkeza and KwaZulu Natal unpacking the bow which was known as umakweyana, umakweyana, the centrally braced bow and the the shitende or chitende for the shangan and so i just realized that you know we have all these bows you know the ububuru we have um 
umkangi, we have ukubu. And uh, what I then knew is that sometimes we have this idea that all bows are the same, it's like all drums are the same, it's a membrane on, a, on, a, on wood. But what I was trying to unpack is that we have different bows that are connected to different peoples, a different technology that is used in very context specifically, but also that how then the technology is played, how it's made, are unique to a space and that uniqueness makes the conversation of the connection so interesting. Southern Africa that are played differently, made differently. And so for when I was presenting, you know, the arguments or suggesting the research in South Africa to a cohort of uh, a group that some were from Africa, some were from Asia, and we were starting to, you know, figure out what the researchers would be about. I then showed them some of the bows. So, for example, when mentioning 
we have umkhope umkhope being a friction bow the same bow then being used in a different part of the continent or amongst a different group of peoples being known as umqangi umqangi We have, as I had mentioned, Iati or Kanye Uati, an open stringed bow. We had Umakweyane, Umakweyane, which now brought me to the centrally braced bow, which is similar to the Shitende, and which was my entry point and my argument point into the Malunga, which is bows that are centrally braced. Braced, which I mean is that they are braced centrally, in, not necessarily in the middle, but to create two fundamental notes. And... And so what I had argued was, or what I'd begun to see is that we have a whole plethora of bones, bows that exist in, in the continent of Africa that are played differently, thought up differently, exist in different ecologies, with different philosophies, practices. But what they unite, uh, where they unite is that they're all musical bows, which means they are all compositionally made with the stave, which is a stick, they have a calabash, some have a brace, some use a cloth, and they have a string, and they are played with the hands. The note is changed with the moving of the fingers. And this became, this created a lot of neuro pathways, a lot of excitement for me when I saw and watched the Malunga being played in India. And I said, oh, wow, I need to go there and understand and make this instrument. And so... I did spend some time in Gujarat meeting Master Sultan in Vijapur and spent some time learning to make that bow. Prior to going to India, I had spent some time in KZ and KwaZulu Natal with Uma Bhavi Kilengema. And Uma Kulu also taught me how to make the Uma Kweyana, Uma Koyana as it's called in Swaziland. And so the uh, so these are on the east coast of southern Africa. I then chose to choose Mozambique because it was such a pivotal point within the trade of Africa and Asia. And uh, I chose those two points because they existed on the east coast of Africa. But also had had connections to the hinterlands or internal, internal landscapes and cultural masses of South Africa or southern Africa. So, as you can see, the Molunga, this strange bow, is really a, one of the points of great research uh, to, um, that, will, that will help us to understand the links between what Africans have brought across the globe with their various sorts of music. So now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, who's Amy Caitlin. She's an ethnomusicologist at UCLA's Center for India and South Asia. She has published several interesting books, called, including Sidi Sufis, African, Mystic, uh, African Indian Mystics of Gujarat, and co-edited a volume, Sidi's and Scholars Essays on African Indians. She's also produced a number of uh, videos and uh, so on and so forth. 
but she's been part of a group of social activists, including one of our uh, editors of our three volumes, Beirut of the University of California, Irvine, uh, who have worked with the cities of Gujarat. And now we talked about the, the Malunga and the Bows, and instead we, we need to now move to Amy's presentation, putting us with the lovely cities of Gujarat and this bow, the Malunga. Uh, Leka, could you put up the last video? Thank you, Dr. Kenneth Robbins and the Bengaluru Historian Society for inviting me to speak on behalf of the Sidi African Indian community about their sacred Malunga musical bow and its performed oral literature. I'm very happy that some of the Sidi musicians who have participated in this research are able to join us today. The Department of Ethnomusicology at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. The Sidi Malunga is the Nishan or emblem of the Sidi African Indian saint, Baba Gore. It speaks of the African history and Sufi Islamic faith of his Sidi followers who sing his praises with the musical bow. The Sidi Malunga is an African Indian braced musical bow whose name speaks of its descent from the African hunting bow, weapon and musical instrument. The Malunga's name may have disappeared in Africa, but it survives in Gujarat at the margins of the eastward African diaspora, where it speaks of its origin from the old Bantu word root, lung, to join by tying. Baba Gore's name comes from Baba, father. Gore was bestowed on him by Rifai Sufis in Basra, Iraq, from the Arabic meaning deep, as in deep meditation. Through linguistic shift, Gore became Gore, meaning grave in Persian and Urdu. Baba Gore is considered by his followers, Sidi, by, by all his Sidi followers, to be their ancestor interred in Gujarat. He's also known as Gori Shah Bava, Gori Pir, and Hazrat Mubarak Nubi, the blessed Nubian saint from Nubia. The Sidi Mulunga is always played along with the coconut shell rattle called My Mishra, mother from Egypt. Believers say My Mishra was Bava Gore's sister and sailed from Misr near the northeastern corner of Africa across the Red Sea and the Arabian Sea, along with her six sisters and their brother, a Sidi navigator, so that she so that she could rescue Baba Gore from the demoness Makandevi in Ratanpur, the Hill of Gems, where Baba Gore's Darga or mausoleum remains an active Sufi saint since its Sufi site since its first recorded pilgrimage in the early 15th century. The Darga is on the pilgrimage route to the Narwanda Dam and the Statue of Unity of Sardar Patel, the largest statue in the world, a recent destination for tourists as well as religious pilgrims. Like her brother Baba Gore, my Mishra is, re is revered as a Rifai Sufi practitioner and a Sidi ancestor saint. Her emblem or Nishan is the eponymous coconut shell rattle filled with pebbles, Kajina, from the seashore. These pebbles in the two coconut shell rattles represent the fertility of a woman's two ovaries and her nourishing breasts. Each rattle is wrapped with a piece of red or green textile, the auspicious colors of Islam. The textile also represents the ordini or veil of my Mishra as she was dressed for her thwarted wedding. Although her marriage was never completed, she is still called the mother, Mai, who came from Mishra or Egypt, the mother of all Sidi believers who give blessings of fertility and much more. Note that the upper sections of the Malunga string is longer than the lower section. Thus, the two sections create two different musical pitches. The two sections are the reverse of the African-Brazilian berimbau, whose lower note is in the lower section of the bow string. The malunga is often used as a speech surrogate in which the rhythms of Islamic prayers or CD jikars are reproduced and repeated, conveying sacred words through the rhythms of the vibrating string 
when struck by its striker called Chop or Chabuk whip. Those accents are amplified by one coconut rattle, my Mishra, held in the right hand with the striker Chob, thus amplifying its rhythms. The Malunga also gives rhythmic and drone accompaniment to Sufi Muslim texts, which may be danced, played in ritual processions, sung to melodies, or spoken, sometimes to encourage donations of alms, zakat, one of the pillars of Islam. Malang Muhammad Sidi spoke at a workshop for Veena Pani Center for Music in Bengaluru on the practice of basti, religious mendicancy, and zakat almsgiving during our Sidi Goma tour of India in 2005. At a gathering in a Brahmin home, the members likened Sidi Basti to Hindu Unchavritti, the highest livelihood, because both sing sacred texts while walking in public streets for alms, just as Saint Tyagaraja did. An early description. An early depiction of the Sidi Malunga is found in this 19th century company style painting. Its handwritten Gujarati inscription in Devnagari script, penned across the top of the canvas, reads, quote, Kachi Sidi people's damal, meaning ecstatic dance and music, and you also see men and women watching from a distance in this picture. End of quote. The Malunga raises red and green flags flying atop the bow. To, above and to the left side of a group of Kachi Sidi men who are performing the Dhamal, an ecstatic counterclockwise circle dance, in a public space with diverse spectators in an undisclosed location in Kach Gujarat. Unlike this scene, the Malunga is most often found today in ritual spaces within or outside a Sufi shrine or during Basti, religious mendicancy in a village or neighborhood. The Namal group in the painting includes my Mr. Coconut Rattle pair, medium-sized Musindo African drums played with both hands, one small Sidi Damal drum held under the left arm and played with the right hand, and the large Mogurman standing drum in the center played by two men. The raft-shaped shaker on the bottom right, Kayamba of Tanzanian peoples, is no longer known by Sidis. All these instruments and their names originated in East Africa. The Gujarati inscription at the bottom center of the canvas reads, this large picture was made by Junagad resident Vadalal Muhammad Juma. It displays a complete picture of Kutch. The handwritten inscription on the bottom right provides the dates according to both the Hindu Sambat calendar and the English calendar. The English calendar date suggests that the Kachi Siddhis were celebrating the Prophet Muhammad's birth anniversary, because according to the Islamic calendar for 1884, February 15th is the date of the Prophet's birthday, as well as his death anniversary, Eid or Milad. One CD holds a pair of my Mishra coconut shell rattles, the usual way of playing them while dancing the drum dance, Goma. The performer's, performer's diverse headgear suggests different Muslim affiliations, occupations, or perhaps the communities of their employers or masters, including a Turkish fez-like cap with a tassel and a Baghdadi topi. The same is true of the two separate groups of spectators, many of them absorbed in watching the Namal from the sidelines. The person holding the Malunga is the Nishandar, or bearer, bearer of the emblem, the Nishan of St. Bavagor. He holds one coconut rattle and striker in his right hand, while his left hand holds the Malunga bow with its small hollow gourd dudi resonator and brace, which attaches the gourd resonator to the bow, divides the string into two sections, and he is shown plucking or touching the upper longer part of the string with the little fingernail of his right hand and striking the lower, shorter part of the string with a wooden striker. These diverse groups of men and women comprised of both Hindu and Muslim, elite and non-elite, suggest a pluralistic ambiance where religious fervor and blessings of Bavagor seem to be of interest to Siddhis and non-Siddhis alike. Until recently, the Malunga was rarely heard outside its traditional Sufi ritual context in Gujarat, which includes Basti, meaning neighborhood or religious mendicancy, especially during seasonal journeys to royal and other wealthy patrons, Hindu or Muslim. Nowadays, folk festivals and tourist shows feature the Siddhi Damal as a fun and incongruous experience with African face and body paint and costumes of peacock feathers, but the Malunga is not usually included as especially talented players and singers are rare to find, like Murjan Ismail Siddhi. 
In 2002, the Molunga was featured on stage in England and Wales during the first Sidi Goma international tour on Black Sufis of Gujarat, sponsored by London's Asian Music Circuit, curated by yours truly, with detailed program notes contextualizing the performances. In spite of being on public stages, the Sidi Goma members felt they were still doing sacred busti, but in more distant neighborhoods. For them, it was an authentic expression of their sacred gifts and a way of sharing more widely their sacred experiences of the joy given to them by their ancestors, saints, Baba Gore and Mai Mishra. With the collaboration of five Sidi shrine groups we recorded throughout Gujarat in 2001, we created the Sidi CD for the tour with contextualizing liner notes. Let's listen to the Molunga solo by Sidi Salam Jafar of Rajbipla. See if you can hear the two pitches of the string, which he has tuned exactly one octave apart, and the gourd resonator opening and closing against his chest, and the Mai Mishra rattle in unison with the striking of the string. We must acknowledge the men and women Malunga Mishandars, Ustads, and Quran Ustadis who collaborated with us in the Sidi Malunga camp in Zainabad, Gujarat. First, the late Sidi Salam Jafar of Rajpipla, who created 16 beautiful Malungas for the camp. The late Sidi Malang Muhammad of Baruch, Malang, Malunga Ustad. The late Sidi Salam Ghulam Hussein, Sidi Salim Ghulam Hussein of Baruch, singer and Malunga expert. The late Sidi Yunus Hajibai of Surendranagar, Malunga Ustad. The late Sidi Sultan Ramju of Viramgam, Malunga Ustad and Mujavari. And Mujan Ismail Sidi Azan, formerly of Arab Tekra, Rod Pipla, now living in Daman, where he makes Tazia Towers for the local Shia community. We must never forget the recently deceased the late Quran Ustadi Romana Ben Bilal Makwa Sidi of Ahmedabad, who became the first woman to master the Molonga, conduct Basti groups, and lead a Sidi Goma group on tours in India and abroad through the ICCR auspices. I'd like you to see two brief examples from chapter nine of our Sidi Molonga project DVD, filmed when we returned to Gujarat uh, one year after the Sidi Goma tour of England, England and Wales, we found two men from the Malunga camp doing busti in South Gujarat a year after the camp. I'm sorry, you'll have to watch it separately, I think. Uh. The Malunga camp inspired Malangbai's disciple Salim to become a full-time mendicant. He could support himself and his entire family by going on busty for alms just once a week. Eight years after our Sidi Malunga camp was held in 2003, Maseem Jamadar, an educated Sidi from Bhavnagar, Saurashtra, had contacted me. Watching after watch our, and watched our Sidi Malunga DVD, and came to Mumbai to play his self-made Malunga for me and Malti Benjaveri, the founder of INT, who helped sponsor our Sidi Malunga camp. He asked us how to learn everything about Sidi history and is still busy doing that. He became a murid of Sidi Salam Jafar of Rajpipla, 
learning to make and play the Siddhi Malunga and the Mai Mishra. He also traveled to East Africa to search, search for the origins of his community and their instruments. He found the origin of the Siddhi Bola or Nangas, now, ex, now extinct in India, and learned to make his own Nangas. He shares some of his experiences on Facebook, including his research in Kenya. One rare reincarnation and rather bizarre Bollywoodization of the Siddhi Malunga occurs in Subhash Gai's reincarnation film, Karz, in which the Siddhis, like fakirs of Balloon Baba, hold Malungas and sing, Am fakiro ko patab hai, sab ke dil ka hal hai. We fakirs know the state of everyone's heart. Malungas being played with in this extravagant uh, scene. We, um, eight years later, without any knowledge of Kars, CDs were trained to play the enemy in the 1988 production Hushal, Apocalypse, a play about atomic war. Hushar was written and directed by Leik Hussein, who directed intensive training camps for Siddhis and Ratampur before choosing the cast of Siddhi dancers and actors. He also played the lead role in Hushar, presented during the West Zone Theatre Festival in New Delhi, Udaipur, and Surat in 1988. The late Siddhi Salim Ghulam Hussein's Malunga and voice were also used extensively on the jazz album Day to Day. by composer and percussionist Sarati Korvar, based in London. Each track is inspired by Salim and Ratanpur Siddhi's passionate devotion to Islam and to their saint, Baba Gaur, as well as by Salim's suffering and desire for release from pain. Their collaboration met with great success, and I hope you can see it one day. And listen. This is the first track. You can find it online day to day. As for the Siddhi Malunga today, we have seen that there are suddenly very precious few senior players. Perhaps now is the time for Siddhis to contemplate the future of the Siddhi Fakir's Malunga the Sidi Malonga is a prime example of the Sidi's endangered, intangible cultural heritage, made especially vulnerable today because of its sacred Islamic nature within an increasingly aggressive majority non-Muslim political environment. I believe the Sidi Malonga and the rich trove of historic documents, oral documents, literature, texts, the jikars associated with the Malunga should be recognized by UNESCO as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity 
during the current international decade of people of African descent, 2015 to 2024 of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy, uh, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we'll take some any questions from the audience, but I'd like to say that what we are seeing really as the way to study the Africans in a global sense is to concentrate on a number of different issues, to bring music to the fore, and we hope to continue that, and two, to bring spirituality. That in the most unlikely places, one finds black spirituality going in every which direction. And uh, next week we'll be talking, as today, we concentrated a lot on Gujarat, because a lot of the slave trade involved with Gujaratis and so on and so forth. And uh, we talked about the CDs in Gujarat. Next week, we'll be talking uh, a lot about uh, Bengal and also about getting both South, Af South Asianists, including Bangladesh and Africans involved in studying the cross-fertilization in a non uh, Eurocentric manner. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Robbins. Thank you, Professor Bhatt. And uh, it has been a fascinating uh, conversation, a fascinating presentation as always. And uh, this being the third in the series, we're looking forward to next Thursday, which will uh, be unfortunately the last one. Yes, I think we should close at this time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all and good night. Good night. See you Bye. Time.